Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, a little housekeeping. Some of you say you like the housekeeping segments even better than the, the actual podcast. To each his own, I guess. I have some upcoming events that are getting slowly added to the calendar. These can be found on my website at samharris.org forward slash events. There are dates in Toronto, London, Vancouver, New York, and Phoenix there. And I believe Chicago is coming soon. Also working on some West Coast dates, probably in San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland. And my book club event with Steve Pinker in L.A. is still in the works. As always, supporters of the podcast will hear about these things first. If you're a supporter of the show, we have your email address, or at least we have the one you used when you started supporting it. But uh, some of you may have changed your addresses in the meantime, or, or you gave an address that you don't check very much. Or if you're on Gmail, I'm told that our emails may be landing in your promotions tab. If that's the case, I think you can train Gmail by moving those emails manually into your inbox. Perhaps there's some other way to influence our robot overlords, but I'm told there's nothing we can do on our end to ensure that Gmail behaves itself. So if you're not getting emails from me, you may check your promotions folder if you happen to be on Gmail. And if you need to change your email address with us, or if you're having problems accessing the Ask Me Anything page on my website, please email info at samharris.org, and we'll sort that out for you. I want to say a few things to those of you who are supporting the show on Patreon. As many of you heard last time around, I announced that I'd be leaving Patreon September 1st. This was in response to the deplatforming of Lauren Southern, the conservative journalist or activist. It's not totally clear what to call her. It really wasn't only in response to that. I've actually had other reasons to migrate away from Patreon that have been building up. But the Lauren Southern thing definitely lit a fire under me. I feel I need to clarify a few things at this point because it's pretty clear I didn't have the whole story when the Lauren Southern incident happened and when I made my announcement. And some of my assumptions about it were clearly wrong. I've since spoken to Jack Conti, the CEO of Patreon, and I've watched the video that he released explaining why Patreon did what it did and what the their actual policy is. I still don't know much about Southern, so I'm not taking any position for or against her here. But it's pretty clear from talking to Jack and watching his video that she was doing things that Patreon would be reluctant to fund. Not from a political point of view, but from just a basic concern about human safety. So my assumptions about what happened there were mistaken. And I have much less of a sense that the incident has any implications for my podcast in the future. Uh, and I've also since heard from many of you who support the show on Patreon, and you really prefer to do it there because you like doing it on a per-episode basis. In fact, some of you prefer this so much that you have built an app online for people to support the show this way, and you're hoping that I will use this app. So I want to say something about that in particular because this is one of the reasons why I was planning to move away from Patreon. In the beginning, it made total sense for people to support the show that way, in a per-episode way. In fact, that was the whole reason why I got on Patreon in the first place, because we couldn't easily implement that on my website. But I'm becoming increasingly sensitive to incentives these days, both how they operate in the world and how they function in my own life. And I've noticed that the per-episode model has a few things wrong with it. It definitely encourages me to produce as many podcasts as I can, which is good, provided that the quality doesn't suffer. And I don't think I was ever going to produce more than one or two a week, unless something changed radically about my production process. That, that feels like the, the fastest pace that would ever make sense. But the per-episode model very strongly disincentivizes me from ever experimenting with the format here. So, for instance, I, you know, if, if I wanted to take a full month to do a podcast that requires much more work, right? Let's say it requires more research or travel or collaboration with others. At the current level of Patreon support, the effect isn't huge, but I'm anticipating how things will look 
months or even years out. And I want to avoid a situation where my doing something different, even for a couple of weeks, suddenly seems like a huge financial cost. Obviously, that would be a good problem to have because it would mean that the show's getting a lot of per episode support, but it seems like a conflict of interest that is worth avoiding, and, and monthly support totally avoids it. So that was one reason why I was moving away from Patreon. But another issue which I hadn't thought about, frankly, is that many of you are also supporting other content there. Uh, and that's one of the great things about the platform. If you went there because you wanted to support this show and then you found other podcasts that you like, you can easily support them without ever opening another account. As you know, I think this is important to the future of digital content. And it really didn't occur to me that my leaving Patreon could adversely affect support for other creators there, which is something I wouldn't want to happen. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to split the difference here. And again, I have other reasons for wanting to consolidate things on my site. We'll be redesigning it eventually, and it just it makes a lot of sense to have everything under one roof there. But I'm going to leave my Patreon account as it is. So if you prefer supporting the show there, you can do that. That's totally fine. As I said, I don't want to do anything to undermine Patreon or the other people who are using it. So I'll just leave the account there. And I'll be pointing new subscribers to my own website because that's where I'm hoping things will grow. But needless to say, however you want to support the show, it is greatly appreciated. So thank you for that. And now for today's guest. Today I'm speaking with Gavin De Becker. Gavin is widely regarded as our nation's leading expert on the prediction and management of violence. He's the best-selling author of The Gift of Fear and several other books on violence prevention. His work has earned him three presidential appointments, and he's been on the President's Advisory Board at the U.S. Department of Justice. He's also worked with the Governor of California. He's worked with universities, corporations, celebrities too numerous to name. His first book, The Gift of Fear, was a number one New York Times bestseller and is now published in 19 languages. And Oprah Winfrey dedicated a full hour on her show to commemorating the 10th anniversary of that book. So Gavin has been extremely influential in how we think about violence, really at every level, from domestic violence to workplace violence to stalking incidents with celebrities, acts of terrorism, assassination. There's really no form of violence you can think of that Gavin hasn't weighed in on at some point. He's worked with security at schools. So it's really, it's really the, the full footprint of violence in our society and how it deranges human life. Gavin has made a study of this, and his advice in this area is extremely good. So I've been a student of Gavin's for many years. He's handled security for me at my events, and he's just a, a great source of expertise on this topic. Gavin was very generous with his time here. I think he was talking to me from as far away as Fiji, but with the miracle of the internet, we got together. And now, without further delay, I bring you Gavin DeBecker. I am here with Gavin DeBecker. Gavin, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, too. Well, I, I have really been looking forward to this conversation. I'm a huge admirer of your work. I am a, a fan. I consider you a friend at this point. You are just exactly the person I want to talk to about this issue. So you have handled security for events that I've been at, both organized by me and for me, for many years. And I will have introduced you properly before this conversation. But your company, Gavin DeBecker & Associates, handles security for like half of Hollywood and Silicon Valley at this point. And I see your presence everywhere. And many people who may not know that about you, know you from your book, The Gift of Fear, which is, if I'm not mistaken, the best-selling book of all time on the topic of preventing violence. And you've, you've written a, f a couple of follow-up books, a book about specifically protecting kids, titled Protecting the Gift. And even more recently, you have a book about how protective services of the sort you run prevent assassinations, and that's titled Just Two Seconds. 
and you've worked all over the place with the State Department and the Department of Justice and corporations and universities, and you've really dealt with security and issues of violence at every level. So my first question, just by way of welcoming you onto the podcast, is how did you come to be in this role? Because you really are, are in a fairly unique position with respect to violence and its prevention. So like everybody, my my work and my life's path began in childhood. I witnessed and experienced a lot of violence, and uh, I did what children do, which is I learned to predict human behavior for my own safety and for the safety of others. And it's not unique, particularly. There are millions of kids who know that when dad comes home in a certain mood, uh, from work early, with a certain attitude toward the other people in the family, and he sits down and he clicks open a bottle of beer and he looks at you a certain way, there are millions of kids who have learned to know that trouble is coming today. And we are in the business of predicting human behavior. So we predict the behavior of, of uh, our siblings and our parents and our teachers and each other. And what I did is by accident or by intent or by fate or destiny, I uh, systematized and, and really studied the ways in which human beings make predictions. And there's no prediction that is more crisp than the prediction that someone makes about their own safety. You could say that of all the remarkable things the mind does, uh, it, it brings its greatest resources when the host itself is in danger. And so the kinds of things I did at 10 years old in predicting violence and, and sort of madness in my own childhood are not terribly dissimilar to the kinds of things that I do today in terms of applying strategies that I think all of us, and, and really it's a key message of my work, as you know, is that all of us have these resources, these intuitive resources inside us. But how is it that you became the go-to guy on this issue? I don't think the history is so entirely unique because I think of uh, you know a, a kid who saw his grandparent die of cancer and then becomes a cancer expert or somebody who, uh, whose father died of a heart attack and they become you know, a heart surgeon or somebody who experienced or witnessed some kind of victimization or criminality and they grow up to become a police officer. My point is that your ghosts can become your teachers. And there are, there are plenty of people who decided, hey, I'm gonna be a psychologist because I think there's money in it. And there are other people who decided I'm gonna be a psychologist because I sense and and introspectively perceive the challenges that, uh, you know, that I have myself or that other human beings have. And if I, Gavin, were choosing a brain surgeon, I don't want the one who's there because he thinks he can make a good living as a brain surgeon. I want the one who's there because he's been absolutely fascinated with this topic his whole life. So for me, at 10 years old, I was home from school and I saw on television the assassination of President Kennedy. And my father was not in my life at that time. And Kennedy was a kind of father figure to me, even a similar appearance. And it, it really knocked me on my ass that somebody young and, and, and in the prime of their life and involved in my life as a public figure, of course, uh, could be assassinated even in the presence of what at the time was the highest level protective coverage in history. And so, you know, I asked myself the question at 10 years old, as I looked around and saw people crying and, and saw people upset, and, and you could see how this event came into our homes and our school and our community. And it, it made me wonder forever about the best strategies for, for protection. I never followed, uh, you know, an interest in in the conspiratorial aspects of the Kennedy assassination, though I have opinions on it, that wasn't what fascinated me. What fascinated me was the physical, on-the-scene aspects of how people could be protected. And, and eventually, as I got into that field more and more by being the best kind of student, that's not the student who goes to a college class necessarily, that's the student who never leaves the college class. I did it all my waking hours, everything I saw, everything I read, everyone I met, I extracted something that was relevant to my fascination. I call it you know, now my work. And so as I developed strategies and ideas and began to write on the topic, I saw that the strategies that applied to the people we protect the most, presidents, vice presidents, senators, congressmen, governors, et cetera, 
they also applied in far larger numbers to regular people. For example, a public figure in America is attacked, uh, you know, on average every five years. Uh, but a, a woman is murdered by a husband or boyfriend on average every five hours. So the same strategies can be applied, not in terms of physical protective coverage, but in terms of identifying the pre-incident indicators associated with violence. And, and no crime in America is more preventable or predictable than spousal homicide, because all the pre-incident indicators are there. So that, that's a long answer to the question of how it is that I followed this path. Uh, I can give you some you know, steps along the way that maybe make it seem like less of a magic trick if you want me to, but I think it's like everybody's life. I think you, you take the next step one after the other and, and, and you, I'm gonna use the word destiny for a moment because I do tend to believe just about everything is predetermined, but uh, I, I think you, you know, you, you're going to do what you're going to do with your set of circumstances and your biology and your meal that day, and your amount of sleep, and your age, and your place of origin, birth, I think you're going to do what you're going to do. And I did my part. Well, let's just jump into a discussion of violence, because that's, there's so much to talk about there. And I want to have this conversation not merely as an intellectual exploration of the topic. I, mean, I think violence is incredibly interesting just as a topic, but I want this conversation to be useful to people in, in very practical ways. And, and I, so I want us to give people a deeper understanding of violence and how to avoid it. And when I mentioned that I would be talking to you in, in a previous podcast, I said that given the numbers of people who are listening, it doesn't seem far-fetched to say that this is the kind of conversation that could save a life or two or at least prevent some very significant suffering. But before we begin, I think we need to deal with the what's well, essentially a, a statistical concern that I think many of our listeners will have in their heads, which is that violence is now rare enough in our society that there really is no reason to think much about it. I mean, it's, it's to, to have a conversation of, of the sort we're about to have is essentially morbid, or it's, it's a kind of fear-mongering. Why do you think people at this moment in a society like our own I mean, speaking now of you know the, the developed world, even the safest places within it, why do you why do you think people should think about violence? So uh, you know, I, I actually have to laugh at the idea that uh, uh, that people think a, an experience that has been going on throughout human history and is not only unabated and uninterrupted, but that they think a political statistic. Remember, statistics from the federal government are often highly politicized in terms of how they're developed. For example, there was a moment when rape statistics went down uh, because they redefined rape. So rape involved, it used to involve any form of penetration, and then they defined it in a slightly different way in terms of penetration, and guess what happened? Rape decreased. But we are talking about a human behavior, rape, that has gone on throughout human history. And so the idea that politicians say, as many speeches have been given along these lines, you know, we must stamp out rape in our culture. That's comedy. That, that's absolutely ridiculous. And we're talking about behaviors that while violence may tick down slightly, we'll say there's 26,000 homicides in America. And so a 10% reduction means that there's closer to 23,000 homicides in America. And that's not relevant to the individual who's facing a circumstance in which the pre-incident indicators of homicide are present. So for me, for example, a white male, I might walk around all day, every day, and go years without experiencing something that makes me raise my eyebrow and say, hmm, this, this dark alley doesn't feel right. This circumstance, this person, this employee we're firing, this uh, moment, for some reason, gives me reason to, uh, to respond, and I get a, a fear response or an intuitive response about safety. So I might go years without that. But a woman, if you ask, for example, I did a thing a couple of years ago where we asked random men and filmed them and said, when is the last time that you experienced fear about your own safety? And the men tended to answer, hmm, uh, uh, oh, eight months ago or, or when I was in Iraq or you know, when I was first on the police force or never. And then we asked the same number of women. And the women said, today. 
or last night while I was walking to my car after our company party, or yesterday when that ex-boyfriend called me again after I asked him not to. My point being that it is a totally different experience for women than it is for men. It's a totally different experience for minorities than it is for uh, white men, you know, ages 25 to 50. Uh, and, and so the idea that violence, which is an enduring element of human behavior, is affected because a statistic goes down. I'll give you a quick example in California. In California, there are a thousand people shot every week. There are a thousand people shot every week. So most people are stunned by that, uh, that statistic. I'm not. Why is it not a big deal in one sense? Because there aren't a thousand who die. They go to the hospital, they deal with their, uh, their shooting injury, and it's almost like a, uh, like a car accident injury or slipping in the shower. But nonetheless, there's a thousand people who are shot in California every week. And so you now have a circumstance in which that statistic is worth avoiding meaning I'm just as interested in avoiding being shot as I'm interested in avoiding being killed. And yet, what's happened in America, and this is really key when people think about this topic, what you ought to look at is not the rate of, let's take firearms deaths, uh, it's the rate of aggravated assault. And here's the reason. What changed in the last 40 years profoundly? 911 service that calls ambulances and police officers to us more quickly, even if we can't say the address. Ambulance services that get us to nearer emergency rooms than ever existed before because Americans are so unhealthy that the, one of the biggest growth businesses is hospitals. Emergency room strategies refined by the Vietnam War and the wars in Iraq so that shooting trauma is, is dealt with. So the odds of dying from receiving a bullet are vastly lower than the odds of receiving a bullet. And so my view is, I just want to avoid tissue damage. I'm not really interested in whether it's good or bad tissue damage. I'm in the business of helping people uh, prevent tissue damage. And in my case, with my clients, to prevent targeted tissue damage. So this is a, a, a long way of saying that statistics that say the crime rate is down do not change the relationship between me and that guy standing in front of me in the dark alley at two in the morning as I come out of a, you know, a late party somewhere. One must always measure what's going on in their environment without regard to statistics. Uh, here's a 20 second story. Years ago, there was a, an actress, you'll remember, uh, some audience members might not, named Teresa Saldana, who was uh, stabbed by a mentally ill man who stalked her for a year, traveled from Scotland to kill her, uh, tried to buy a gun but couldn't, and so he used a knife instead. And uh, she called the police, uh, the sheriff's department actually, about the fact that somebody was calling her mother and trying to get information about where she lived, and then was calling her agent and trying to get information. And the and the police officer said on the phone, "Look, ninety nine percent of the time in these cases, nothing happens." Well, he was right. His statistics were right on, perfect. 99.9% .9 of the time with media figures being stalked or pursued, it doesn't end in homicide. 45 minutes later, she walked out of her apartment and she was stabbed 18 times through the chest and spent the next two years you know, dealing with that uh, surgically. And so the statistic was not valuable to her. And statistics, you know, you're sitting on a plane and you look out the window and, and the left engine is on fire. You don't say to yourself, ah, hey, you know, flying is safer than driving. In, in your moment, in your circumstance, there's risk and there's danger. And, and that's where we live, in our moment, in our circumstance, in our situation. And a quick thing is that on the actress I just talked about, Teresa Saldana, when I interviewed her assailant in, uh, in prison years later, and asked him, you know, would you kill her if she were, he still wanted to kill her. Would you kill her if she were in this room right now? And he said, no, not unless I had a gun. Because he regretted and, and was disappointed that he'd had to use a knife. My, my point is that Saldana, anybody in the world could have said to her, hey, young actress who's, you know, barely known at all, forget about it. 99.9% .9 of the time, nothing happens and their statistics would be accurate but their outcome would be grossly inaccurate. I do want to talk about these specific cases of public figures and the difference between men and women in their relationship to violence. Just generically speaking, there, there are different 
types of violence, and this is another source of confusion for people. So there are things like there's there's social violence, we like two guys in a bar, you know, one says, what the fuck are you looking at? And then it escalates from there. And that's quite different from predatory violence, like like rape as, as a prime example. And these are both different from ideological violence of the sort that we see in acts of terrorism. And acts of terrorism are only superficially similar to mass shootings by mentally unstable people of the sort that we tend to see in schools or, you know, movie theaters and you know, sh shopping malls. These are, they're obviously surface features that lead people to think that someone like Jared Loeffner is doing something analogous to what Al-Qaeda is doing. But these are fundamentally different acts of violence. And this tends to confuse people. So is there anything you want to say about the general landscape of violence before we get into some of the more fine-grained considerations of the sort you, you bring up in your book? Uh, yes, uh, a great question. And I like, uh, I'd like to, to express, because going with what you said about making this useful and providing some practical information that people can understand about the resources they already have, I know we'll be talking about intuition, but one of the reasons that we say things like, this is the safest city in America, um, so my odds are better living here, or the statistics are down, or this is the least, you know, violence we've had, uh, I mean, uh, high-end violence we've had since, you know, 1957, is we are all automatically looking to exclude ourselves from the population of the stories we hear. So, for example, if I hear that a guy was eaten by a, an alligator in Florida, I can write that off quick because I'm not swimming in the Everglades. And if I hear that a woman was raped, I can write that off because I'm not a woman. And on and on and on, we all do this. And one of the, one of the most uh, substantial ways that we do it is by assigning categories to types of violence. And now I'm right on your question. There's workplace violence. There's school violence. Um, is there a difference between them? Yes, there's a difference. The difference is the geography. That's the difference. The difference is the moniker that the news media gives to it. Another school shooting today in Omaha, Nebraska, um, another workplace violence event in Omaha, Nebraska, they, it's a faster way to tell the story. But those two are remarkably similar, right? The, the student almost is an employee in the environment. The, uh, the workplace violence perpetrator is dealing with relationships and dealing with feeling alienated and things aren't fair and others don't treat him well. They're nearly identical. But the geography is different. Now let's go to the shopping center shooter. Is the shopping center shooter different because he's in a shopping center versus in a workplace versus outside of school? See, my, my point is that the choice of venue for explosive acts of violence, and I'll speak specifically now about multiple victim shootings, which are you know nearly a weekly event in the United States, so much so that they are not even national news anymore. They are local news. So a multiple victim shooting, a guy who shoots four people at his workplace, if they don't all die, and if there isn't any video, uh, that won't be on the news nationally. And so a lot of it is driven by the video, and you know the video I mean, the helicopter shot of the school with all the police and all the firemen around uh, you know, after uh, a shooting like Newtown or any other school shooting. So speaking of school shootings, is a shooting like Newtown inherently different from a shooting by students like at Columbine. Not inherently. Yes, they are, have different motivations and they have different reasons, but a good way to look at this, and this is, I'm going to go a level deeper when I say this, is that during the year that 9-11 happened and there were, in effect, 2,200 homicides at the World Trade Center, so that the homicide rate in New York City just went up by 2,200. And what changed? You know, nobody thought of it this way because they isolated that mass murder from all the individual husbands killing their wives and girlfriends and, and robbers, you know, inadvertently or intentionally shooting, uh, you know, shooting victims of their robberies. But an interesting component that I believe in is that if 2,200 people are killed all at once in a big violent incident like 9-11, mass incidents of homicide will go down in the United States for a while. And why would that be? Because in effect, not a lot of people have the stomach for 
the kind of violence that we see. For example, why doesn't 9-11 happen every year? Because it's a very rare thing for anybody to be willing to do it. Willing to kill themselves, that's more common in Muslim cultures than it is in the United States to, to you know, perish during the event, but it happens, obviously. School shooters like Columbine intended not to survive. And my, my point is that this categorization business is a news media artifact. It is not really about human behavior, because if we take ourselves back a thousand years and we're living in the village and somebody gets killed, we ask a few questions. What, what happened to Steve? Uh, I'm choosing a name that's a modern name in this thousand year old village. We say, what happened to Steve? And it might be that uh, he got into a fight with Bill and he hit him with a rock. It might be that he was killed by a lion or a tiger. We want to know. We're interested. But ultimately, the loss of life as a condition of, of, of you know, human beings living socially has never changed. And it's not going to change. What, what's going to improve slightly is that we will have better strategies for predicting who among our population needs help, in effect, is most likely to act out. For example, the crime rate is down or the violent crime rate is down. That's true, statistically so. It doesn't change anything for the woman whose husband is holding a gun to her head. Nothing is different. But we have to also recognize that the strategies for doing tissue damage have profoundly improved in the same period. So we're talking about crime against us in our own society, and we're not talking about war, which is another way that people meet their end. And so the, the, these, the instruments of violent death everything from the style of how handguns operate better and better to what will soon be weaponized component drones, weaponized consumer drones. Those have gotten so much better that we really have to you know, factor that into the equation. Now you say, well, I'm not going to get killed by a drone because you know, I'm not a public figure at risk of that kind of thing. And that's, that's perfectly true. But is violence all around us anyway? And this isn't to scare people. It's just to say that in a very real sense, you know how the surging water in an ocean doesn't really move, but what's actually happening is energy moves through it? In that exact same sense, the energy of violence moves through this culture. Others as well, but I will say more in this culture than in any place on Earth other than warring cultures. And so some of us experience it as a, you know, an unpleasant breeze that we can tolerate. We hear a story of a friend's daughter in college who was uh, sexually assaulted, and others of us are absolutely destroyed by it, as if by a hurricane. But nobody in America is untouched by the reality. I mean, here's a good example. We turn on the news today and there's a school shooting. You think that doesn't affect us? That profoundly affects all of us. And so whether we were the recipient of tissue damage or not, we're actually experiencing more violence than any other culture in human history because we experience it through television. Yeah, well, I do want to talk about the role of the media here and, and how the internet may have changed things or amplified things. Just to revisit the logic of my question for a moment, because I, I totally take your point that the categorization of violence can be misleading and, and seem to remove us from the epicenter of the problem just by the words we choose. But I think there, there are clearly different pre-incident indicators for different kinds of violence. So, for instance, as you said earlier, men don't tend to walk around worrying about getting raped, and for good reason, because men out, you know, unless they happen to be in prison, aren't often getting raped in our society. And so there, there's a reason why women uniquely inherit that burden. And, I mean, there's, there, there's other differences that are relevant that we could talk about. I mean, women tend to be outweighed by men, you know, virtually all of the men they're around. The men are taller, bigger, their, their upper bodies are stronger. If you're a man, to imagine what this would be like, you have to imagine that every time you get into an elevator, every man in that elevator is, is 60 pounds heavier than you and obviously stronger than you, right? And, you know, women don't tend to challenge other women in public places and, and ask them to go out on the sidewalk so that they can get into a fist fight, as dumb guys do. And when violence is directed at women, it doesn't tend to be of the sort that is a, a fight among apish guys. It's an effort to physically control her, 
to move her to another location to sexually assault her if it's you know, stranger violence, very likely. So there, there are differences here, to add one more variable here that I, I mentioned briefly. There's a big difference between a mentally ill perpetrator of a workplace shooting or a school shooting or a mall shooting and a perfectly sane, ideologically driven terrorist. The pre-incident indicators will be different. They'll be um, in the, in the backstory of the terrorist. There may not be any of the th things you hear in the backstory of the mentally unstable, you know, mass shooter because he's not mentally unstable. He's just ideologically driven. I was kind of pushing you in that direction, but that's actually, in, in my view, not in contradiction with anything you said about the other ways in which we're, our categories mislead us. Well, I think that's all of that's right. And, and what you said about the, uh, the woman in the elevator and for a man to have the same experience, everybody would have to be taller and 60 pounds heavier uh, and muscular. And also everybody would have to be familiar with the territory of violence and force in a way that we're not. They'd all have to be martial arts experts because women traditionally in Western culture have been told this is not for you. You, you're not supposed to understand the code of human violence. And a, a big part of my work is to say you do understand the code of human violence and you have all the resources that are necessary to protect yourself. And the protection might not come in the form of upper body strength and disabling your assailant. It might, by the way, but it might not come in that form. It might come in the form of intuiting earlier than a man might that you are at risk. And, uh, and that's a, a skill and a resource that's been developed, uh, you know, what I would call the wild brain developed over millions of years that is, is uh, slightly more tuned in women, but also used more often in women. But let's go to a different category, not just women. There are other kinds of people who are victimized more easily, and it, it'll be obvious why that is. Um, children. So children are the subject of all variety of physical assaults more often than people like you and I are I'm speaking about, you know, people our age and, and, uh, and socioeconomic environment and, and uh, the kinds of lives we live. So, you know, something like 15 kids are killed every week by their parents in the United States. So I'm not speaking to children here where I could say to them, you know, uh, you have nothing to worry about from your parents who love you. And the odds are so overwhelmingly out of 60 million of you right now, the odds are so overwhelmingly low that you would ever have an experience with your, your parent trying to harm you. However, uh, if you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G pre-incident indicators, then you have a reason to be concerned. Well, again, we're not speaking to children uh, who are inherently, throughout human history, life's miseries have fallen disproportionately on children. And uh, so the various categories of who we are and the demographic that we fit into is relevant um, depending on where you put us. If you put us in Iraq, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're in great danger, or you put us in, in Afghanistan. So the geography has an influence, all of these things do. But I think what I, what I wanna say that's important here, and it just goes to your observation about the, the terrorist or the ideologically motivated violent actor, you know, the terrorist is very similar to the soldier. Both, both people, you know, we take young men who would never kill anybody. And if we thought they would kill anybody, we'd be scared of them. And we take young men and militaries throughout human history have developed strategies for getting young men to be willing to place themselves at risk of being killed and to do this unspeakable and unforgivable thing, which is kill another person. And that requires inculcation and training that militaries, I'll choose our military for a moment, have gotten so good at that today we have a far higher participation rate in combat. This is a super interesting thing. Back in the Civil War, about 50% of the soldiers actually participated. Others would put their head down and wait for it to end. How do we know that? Because corpse after corpse after corpse is found with the ball still in their rifle. And sometimes two or three balls in the rifle. You know, you had to fire the musket and then load in a and tap in the gunpowder and do all of that stuff. So what did they do? They were reloading and not firing. They were in complete trauma. Uh, they were shitting their pants. They were grasping the ground. 
and 50% participated, and those were the, the, the men who were more inclined to. Today, we have moved that statistic up through Vietnam and World War II, we moved it up, and now we have it at 90%. So 90% of American soldiers participate in combat, which is against our nature, you understand. And that's why when people come back from the, tra the trauma of war and they suddenly are without this great family of, of uh, men and women they served with, we see so much PTSD. And it's why suicide rate has killed, the suicide in, in soldiers has killed more people than combat as you may know, coming out of Iraq. I, I don't want to, that's a tangent we'll, we'll avoid for right now. But the broader point is that, and this is an important one as we move into, in this discussion, as we move into the good news, we're, we're still on the bad news right now, it's important that people realize that violence, not only part of America, but part of our species. And ultimately, as the most powerful people in, in history, Americans, we've climbed to the top of the world food chain, you could say, but now facing not a single enemy or predator who poses us any danger of consequence, we've found the only prey left, which is ourselves. And nobody should doubt this, and I'll give you two good examples. In the last two years, more Americans died from gunshot wounds than were killed during the entire Vietnam War. Now let's go to Japan. It's got a population of about half hours. In other words, it's a big country. The number of young men shot to death in a year in Japan is equal to the number killed in New York City in a single busy weekend. So all the stats in the world will not change the fact that America is a particularly violent culture. And you know, by the time your podcast is aired, Thousands more Americans will have suffered a shooting injury, for example, and thousands will have, will have faced a criminal, and hundreds will have been uh, raped by strangers, and thousands will have been raped by boyfriends and spouses. And so that's what you have to believe in order to bring your resources to the table. Because if you actually believe what a politician says, oh, the crime rate is down, didn't we do a good job? Didn't the FBI and this administration do a good job for you in, in stamping out violence? If you believe that, then you tune down the radio channel that has to be the highest, which is your own intuition. Let's talk about intuition, because we have just said that people are fairly confused about violence and, and tend to be bad at dealing with some of the information that's out there about it. But this point you make again and again, you've made it here, and, and it's the very title of your book, The Gift of Fear. There's one thing that we are actually very good at. Evolution has made us experts at detecting danger and detecting shady people, you know, fe feeling uncomfortable in the presence of people who are liable to do us harm. Talk about intuition here and what it means to trust it and why so many people are unaware of the, the, the validity of trusting it, the, the reasons given for not trusting it. Talk about the primacy of intuition for a moment. Well, here we get to, I think, the biggest gift we can give to listeners. And, it, and this goes for female listeners and male listeners. This goes for decisions you make in your work uh, and decisions you make for your safety. Ultimately, the biggest decision we all make is who to include in our life and who to exclude from our life. That's choosing friends, uh, spouse, neighbors, all, uh, you know, uh, uh, co-workers, et cetera. We make those choices. Those choices aren't made for us. And so my advice always is to make very slow and careful decisions about whom you include in your life and very fast decisions about whom you exclude. So if you have that nanny that you're uncomfortable about, uh, she goes quickly. There's no reason to keep her around. I mean, I've had people through my career say, you know, should we put in a nanny cam because we're worried that this nanny uh, is doing something dangerous with our kids? And I say, no, you should get rid of the nanny because no kid is going to thank you in 20 years. <laughs> Gee, mom, thank you for having that video of me being hit by a spoon on the head by that crazy nanny you guys hired. And so the concept of listening to intuition is what I want to focus on for a moment. Because America particularly, or Western societies, we look to government and we look to experts and technologies and corporations to solve our problem for us. And I am very glad to tell everybody here that the police are not going to protect you because they're not going to be there during the moment that you face an intruder. 
or you face a violent situation. And, and government's not going to protect you. It can't. It tries to pretend it can, but it can't. And the only thing that's going to protect you is your own intuition, which is your own ability to recognize that something is up while it's, while it's right in front of you or while it's in your environment. And I think, as you said, Sam, it's super hard for people to accept the importance of it because intuition is usually looked on you know, as, uh, with some contempt. It's described as emotional or unreasonable or inexplicable, and husbands make fun of wives for feminine intuition, and they don't take it seriously. But um, what I can tell you about intuition, I learned from the origins of the word itself. The root of the word, inter, means to guard and to protect. Super interesting that that's what it means. We think we're using intuition to make a thousand other decisions, but what it's built for, what it's in this system for is to guard us and to protect us. And, and what, it, you know, what it does is, and I'm really going to quote you for a second here because you said a moment ago that evolution has really honed this. True, we didn't get the biggest claws, we didn't get the sharpest teeth or, or the biggest muscles. What we got is the biggest brains. And the idea that we use the, you know, the expression gut feeling, well, the gut actually has more brain cells than a dog. So the gut is literally where a lot of that thought is going on. That's why, you know, you get that bad feeling in your stomach about this employee, this friend, this thing somebody said to you, this danger. Uh, and, and that's a very meaningful thing. Gut feeling is, is the perfect word for it. And it's visceral. It's in the tissue. And it isn't just a feeling. No, it's called the enteric nervous system. Well, you've given it, you're smarter than I am. You gave it a better name. The, the idea is that this is a process, this, this process we ridicule, intuition, is a process more extraordinary and ultimately more logical. In the natural order of things, it's more logical than the most fantastic computer calculation. And it's our most complicated cognitive process. Uh, and, and it's also, in some ways, it's the simplest, which I'll explain. But what it does, intuition, is it connects us to the natural world and to our nature so that when we are free from judgment and we've got only perception, we say that thing, you know, in, in recounting what happened to us, somehow I knew. So if people will do these two things, one is to pay attention to intuition. It's, in my opinion, it's always right in two important ways. One is it's always based on something. And two, it always has your best interest at heart. And so I'll give you a fast example. You're in an airport and you get that feeling, I shouldn't get on this plane. And uh, millions of people have had this feeling. This plane's gonna crash, something, they get anxiety about it and I shouldn't get on this plane. So what I ask people to do is look introspectively for a moment at where that feeling's coming from. And if it is coming, from a news story you saw you know, two weeks ago on television of an ugly plane crash in, in Peru, that is not in your, based on your, your uh, environment or your circumstance, it's based on your memory or your anxiety, and that's not actual fear. If, however, the feeling is based on seeing the pilot stumble out of the bar at the airport and, and you know, make his way slowly down the jet walk, now you've got something that's in your environment. And the question to ask always, this is how, you tell the difference between true fear, like I'm afraid of getting on this plane, and unwarranted fear, worry, anxiety, et cetera. This is how. True fear will always be based on something in your presence and will always be based on something you perceive. It, the, the signal comes from your perception, from your senses unwarranted fear will always be based upon memory. And, uh, and so it's something you remember, something you recall, something you're, you're worrying about or something you're thinking about. But something based on your actual environment is a gift, hence the title of that book. There's not an animal in nature that would say, oh, I don't want that gift. Don't tell me when I should be worried about my safety. It's, it's, it's so much trouble. You know, there's no antelope that suddenly is filled with fear and says to itself, it's probably nothing. But human beings every day are engaged in the constant prosecution of their own feelings. And you know, the, the most vivid example I'm aware of is a woman 
alone in a building late at night. She's working late in the office and she goes to the elevator. The elevator door opens and there's a guy inside who causes her fear. She's afraid of him. And so what does she do? Most women get into a steel soundproof chamber with someone who causes her fear, something no animal in nature would do. And why does she do it? Because she says, I don't want to be the kind of person who makes a decision because of the guy's race or because his clothes look shabby. I don't want to be like that, or I don't want to offend him, or I don't want to make him angry. She talks herself out of what I call prosecutes, her own jury's conclusion. And she talks herself out of it and gets into the elevator. And, and as I say, these are things that no animal in nature would ever even remotely contemplate. And human beings do it every day, participating in their own victimization. The elevator example brings up some other issues here that are hugely important. And this is the, the other side of the, the balance of, uh, that, that causes people to, to not value intuition or to, or to prosecute their, their feelings, as you say. And it's, it's that these, these moments of, of negative intuition can be in contradiction to a variety of social norms that well-intentioned people want to adopt. And so yeah, you just named one. They, they, you don't want to be racist, right? So if you're a white woman and the elevator door is open and the man on the elevator who makes you uncomfortable is black, well, you may just get on that elevator perversely to prove to yourself and to him that you're not racist, right? You override your intuition uh, and in fact, I know someone who was in a circumstance like this, and, and it, it didn't end well. And uh, you, we can make it even more provocative than that. There are certain circumstances where the race of the person is obviously relevant information. It's, it's, it is in and of itself a pre-incident indicator or, or a statistically relevant fact, regardless of any other messages that are coming. There, there are places where it's more surprising or less surprising to see a person of a certain race. And people feel very bad. They've, we've all been trained to ignore those facts, that, which again, we can, in many cases, just instantly and intuitively surmise. So what are good people to do with that? Well, I mean, the, the best gift any of us can give to not only ourselves, but our society is that we take care of the person whom nature has made us responsible for primarily, and that's ourselves. And so what I like to do, and in my own life, believe me, I'm no different from anybody else. I make mistakes all the time where afterwards I say, damn it, I knew better. I shouldn't have talked to that person. I shouldn't have said that thing. I shouldn't have gone to that place. And I didn't want to, and I overrode it for some reason. You know, a typical example would be you're invited to dinner at somebody's house and you just don't want to go, uh, but, you, but you go. Um, I think those are these aren't violence issues, but I think they're always mistakes. And uh, there was, a, in, in the Friends uh, television series years ago, Phoebe, uh, the character played by Lisa Kudrow, taught me something really important once. Somebody invites her to dinner and she says to them on the phone, oh, I can't. it's Tuesday night? Oh, I can't because I don't want to. That's pretty fucking strong. If we would all live that way and say, I'm going to listen to myself. I'm going to listen to the voice that's a little bit more important than the voice of political correctness, which is a bullshit scam that is, uh, you know, going on in every culture to one degree or another, and very, very hot right now in the United States. The significant issue isn't the branding of myself in this moment based on my behavior. The significant issue is listening to intuition and have the dialogue with yourself later about why you did or didn't do that. I, I'll give you a, a great example of this. If you a dog, for example, uh, you know, is, is a, uh, an animal that listens to its senses very well and its perceptions. And when I was writing Gift of Fear, a, a good friend of mine said, oh, I know a lot about that. My dog is super intuitive. I said, really, tell me. And she said, well, he hated the contractor that I hired. And he, boy, he was right. That contractor ripped me off. And so I, I said to her, listen, the dog is not an expert on contractors or people. The dog was reacting to you when the contractor came over, right? That you were the one who knew all about contractors and this guy. The dog didn't know that his car was too expensive for the, the, the level of bidding that he was doing or that his proposal was a little bit sleazy. The dog knew you, and the dog doesn't have better intuition. 
here's what the dog has. It is not bothered by the way it used to be, the way it could be, the way it should be, the way it ought to be. The dog doesn't ask any of that question. The dog looks and says the way it is, reality in this moment. And for that reason, animals don't even go into this mental exercise of, I don't want to be this kind of person. I don't want to be the kind of person who's suspicious, for example. I want to interject a quick thing here about about words, is that the root of the word suspicion was also a big teacher for me. That root, suspicere, only means to watch. It doesn't mean to hurt somebody, like, should I feel bad because I'm suspicious of my neighbor when my kids are, you know, playing over at their house and I'm wondering about whether he's an alcoholic or whether he's violent or whether he's, uh, you know, a child molester? So I, I say, oh, I don't want to be suspicious of everybody like that. Well, suspicion only means to watch. It, it is curiosity with the added imperative to watch. And so if you're suspicious of that guy you're getting into the elevator with, you watch. And you change your you change your demeanor, but uh, listen, changing your environment by getting into a steel box with somebody that's a pretty radical decision. When nature has just told you you ought not. I mean, you're going to argue you're going to argue with that because you don't want to be that kind of person. Uh, well, which kind of person do you want to be? The kind that's victimized. So I hit this kind of strong Sam. I know because in this part of our discussion is the gold which is don't worry about why, worry only about is. Is this feeling in this moment something that I am, as a general lifestyle choice, am going to push down and ignore? Or is this feeling in this moment something that I am going to listen to as a general lifestyle choice? Well, I think we should add one more principle here, which you do talk about throughout your work. Uh, it really is the, the foundation of almost everything you recommend. And it's something that people who prepare for violence, who train to defend themselves and others, you know, whether they're martial artists or they get into firearms training, you meet a lot of these people, you can, you can see that they, they not only don't spend time focusing on this principle, but they, their training tends to, in many cases, teach them to ignore it. And the principle is just avoidance. The primary goal here, the first move to keep yourself and those you love safe, is to not be where violence can happen to you. Insofar as your training to protect yourself leads you to be the kind of person who's more likely to put him or herself in the path of violence, that, well, then that's obviously counterproductive. This principle of avoidance, when you marry that to what you just said about intuition, the validity of intuition, that's so much of the story about what, of what it takes to not be a victim of violence and why you cannot afford to be politically correct at all about this. Be politically correct after the fact, as you said, right? You feel, feel guilty after the fact. But if you're not going to be motivated by a split-second sense that the person who's just come into your presence doesn't mean well or represents a, a physical risk to you, if you are going to forsake that signal based on some, you know, larger social concerns that have been drummed into you, you will be the sort of person who never acts to avoid proximity to violence at the first opportunity. Well, I, I, I love the way you said it, and I agree with all of it. And uh, I, I think here I can sell this idea a little bit by offering a value add that has nothing to do with violence, because as you said at the beginning, most people assume that it's so rare in, in our culture or in their lives that they don't, you know, you would, you would think it's morbid to think about it, and, uh, uh, or they would, not you. And so, you know, the, 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 the sell is that the same resource I'm talking about, intuition, is how you get rich. It's how you choose a great spouse. It's how you fulfill your purpose here on earth. It's what Steve Jobs had It's what uh, and listened to. It's what uh, Jeff Bezos listens to. Uh, if you had all these guys in a room, uh, and by these guys, I mean people who've changed our lives and who've contributed a great deal, they would all tell you that their decisions were not made on the basis of spreadsheets and logic and slideshows and calculators and all of that. Their ultimate decision 
to do something that nobody had ever done before. So logic would tell you, don't do it, right? If, if Jeff Bezos came to me and said, I want you to invest in my company, I'm going to sell books on the internet. Uh, you know, he'd have to say to me, the odds are 99%, you're going to lose all this money. And, and the only reason to do it is if you feel intuitively to do it. Uh, if Steve Jobs were to go somewhere, you know, there's a story of Steve Jobs saying to a friend of his whom he invited to be in the beginning of Apple, uh, that guy was going instead to work for Coca-Cola Company, which he did. And Steve said to him, do you want to change the world or do you want to put sugar in water? And, and, and that guy made his choice. But Jobs did something with his life quite different. So if you listen to your intuition, you're in the great company of people who make a lot of their decisions respecting their intuition. And it, it, basically this means learn how you communicate with yourself. For some people it's a, a gut feeling or a hesitation or, or what have you. And for other people it's the, the highest order messenger that intuition ever sends, which is fear. Let me do, real quick talk about the messengers of intuition. There's curiosity. Curiosity simply says, I got another question here. So you learn a little more. There's hesitation. Uh, there's uh, uh, there's suspicion, which is a pretty important one. There's dark humor, right? You, you know, you say to me, "Hey, I'll see you next week," unless somebody's killed me by then. Well, I'm going to sit down and keep talking to that person. Like what? Because that's not a funny joke. It, it, the you know, there's no there's no pure humor in that, but it's a way of expressing a concern. So I want to know where'd that come from? Oh well, you know. We got this employee, and he's a former Vietnam vet who carries guns a lot, and he's been talking about shooting his mouth off about uh, how much he hates everybody. Ah, so let's talk about that because it'll either be resolved that it's not likely to produce violence or that it is. And then of all the messengers of intuition, I talked about curiosity, suspicion, hesitation. The, the one that must never be ignored is fear. I mean, fear is, it may be whispered or it may be screaming in your ear, but fear basically says, shut up, listen to me, and I will get you out of here. And if you listen, but if you don't listen, uh, then you remain in an environment, and this goes to your question about simply not being there, uh, you remain in an environment that is, uh, you've already been told, contains the ingredients of, uh, of violence. And I want to talk about, because you said you know, social conditioning and political correctness and what have you. What is the opposite of intuition? The opposite of intuition is denial. Because if intuition is knowing something, but not knowing why you know it, then denial is choosing not to know something and having all the details, right? My boyfriend has hit me before. He's, he just lost his job. His drinking has increased. He's just bought a third handgun. Uh, he beat up his last girlfriend. I know all that, and I'm going to act like I don't. So I ask you know, our listeners today the question, which of those two features of human behavior, denial or intuition, is likely to be more relevant and, and uh, constructive for your safety? And also for that other thing I'm selling, which is all the quality in your life, because the quality of your life is completely determined by one thing. And that is, uh, let me make it clear, after you have food, after you have shelter, after you have your immediate uh, physical needs met, the quality of your life is determined by the choices you make in terms of relationships. Employees, employers, family members, spouse, all these choices that we make. That's including the choice, by the way, of who to get into the elevator with, because that's a relationship. Obviously, when violence occurs, there, there's very often a story to be told about the signs that were ignored. But more often than not, you're seeing these signs in other people and often taking steps to avoid further contact with them. And then, you know, nothing bad happens. But the, the signs can be fairly subtle. And I think if you're not, if you're not someone who has your, your head in this kind of thinking, it can seem kind of paranoid to be viewing the world this way. I don't know if this is the greatest example, but this is something that just occurred to me. I, I remember the, I had a problem with my the cable at our house and scheduled a, an appointment for the, the cable guy to come over and, and fix things. And, you know, I don't have a, a standard relationship with the cable guy. This is the kind of thing that happens like once every five years or so. Somebody shows up and 
and it was one of these moments where he he comes through the front door, and I you know I immediately had an intuition that there's there's something off about this guy, and here were the the, the following moments that became salient to me. He comes through the door and he looks at me, but then immediately looks around the house. He's kind of surveying the house, right? So he's looking around at an inappropriately early moment, looking at, at objects. I mean, basically just trying to see, in my interpretation, what else is in the house or who else is in the house. So it's just this very subtle, like, failure of, of ordinary social behavior, looking past the person you're meeting in his house at an earlier moment than you otherwise would. And then when he introduces himself, he says, hey, hi, you know, I'm John. But in the act of telling me he's John, he shows me his name tag as though to prove that he's telling the truth, right? So this struck me as this is a kind of cascade of impressions that's coming. It was later that I unpacked them in terms of you know, why they struck me as wrong, but, you know, struck me as as odd in retrospect that he would he would ask me to verify that that he is actually John by showing me his badge, and then the the, the final kicker was that you know I showed him the television that that we, was having a problem, and um, then you know went off elsewhere in the house. I wasn't you know going to ride shotgun with him every moment while he's fixing the television, but then he comes back uh, when I next see him. He comments on having seen my wife and me in a picture that was in a room that he had no business being in, right? So it was like he had wandered into a room that was just not on his path over the course of dealing with the problem he was there for. And then, you know, all sirens were blaring. I mean, I basically thought that I had a, an ex-con in my house who was casing the place. But people encounter that kind of thing all the time, and I assume don't notice any of it. It's true. And uh, so, so many things you said there that, that I want to comment on. Th there's a thing I call the rule of opposites, which is somebody, I'll use the exact example you had. Somebody's coming to the house and let's make it your wife instead of you who answers the door. So somebody comes to your house and they are, uh, you know, there to fix the, the cable, for example. So in the rule of opposites, you can quickly see what is, what would be in the favorable column and what would be in the unfavorable column. For example, favorable is the guy does his job and nothing more. Unfavorable, the opposite would be he offers to help on unrelated tasks. Uh, favorable would be respectful of privacy and unfavorable would be curious and asking a lot of questions. Uh, you know, favorable would be standing at an appropriate distance. We know the opposite, standing too close. So you can just keep going through this exercise and see that, you know, favorable for the guy who comes to fix the cable would be that he's mindful of time and he wants to work quickly. And unfavorable would be he's in no hurry to leave. And here's the big one. And you saw it in his behavior. You know, favorable would be doesn't care if others are home. Unfavorable would be wants to know if others are home. And so, and I could do 50 of these, but the point is that your intuition did all that automatically. You, you, wouldn't, know, you wouldn't know at that moment. You're not sitting around thinking using that great Sam Harris mind and putting it together in that instant. You just said, mm, something doesn't feel right. And now you perk up and start to pay attention, but this is not the moment to be, you know, working on, to be working on um, why it's happening or what have you. And so, but it's just the moment to listen. And my premise is, in all my work, is that you, Sam, me, and everybody listening has every resource you need to remain safe. You've got this extraordinary resource of intuition and we can predict human behavior incredibly well. We do it every day. We predict the behavior of our children, our, our spouses, our employees, our employers. Politicians predict the behavior of voters, obviously. Advertisers predict the behavior of, of uh, consumers. And so when you, I'll give you a, a fast example here. Let's imagine that, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you're at the airport and you see a man who insists on being first in the ticket line. He pushes a little bit. He looks at his watch a lot. He appears exasperated uh, because the ticket agent's going so slowly. And after he gets his ticket, he rushes off carrying his bags and he appears to be rushed and stressed. So you don't need to be a genius to figure out the backstory. If you said, what is the story on that man that he looks expectantly at each gate as he passes by the numbers and he's running along with his luggage? Is he a politician seeking votes? No. Is he a charity worker asking for donations? Or is he a person late for a flight? 
Uh, my point is, we know all this stuff. Uh, we know the pre-incident indicators of our college-age kid is not going to make it. We know those because all you do is apply the rule of opposites. The student who's going to make it, what does he do? He talks about his future after college. He's always researching job opportunities. He you know, gets all the books and the material he's supposed to get. He shows up at school on time. And what is the one who's not going to make it? The opposite. So if you apply that to employing people, if you apply that to choosing a job and accepting a job, if you apply that to, and here's the big one, choosing a boyfriend or choosing a husband, then uh, you, know, you could answer the question about your repairman um, who you got the signal so early. And, and I, I want to tell you a great story because it's similar to what you're talking about. You got it literally on the basis of an eye movement. That is what sold you on and told you, keep listening, keep watching, something's up here. That one little thing. And so th this is a true story of a guy I interviewed, a pilot named Robert Thompson, and he was uh, going into a convenience store like a 7-Eleven. And he walked into the store and he looked at the person behind the counter. He was immediately overcome by a sense of fear. And he walked out of the store and get in his car and drove away. And that is the end of his story. And, but it's not the end of the story of what happened in the convenience store. Because about three hours later on the news, Bob Thompson saw that at what must have been exactly the time he was there, a police officer was shot and killed by a robber in the store. And so when you start to unpack that, what we learn is, I said to Bob Thompson, I interviewed him, what did you, why would you be afraid in a convenience store? What, what were you reacting to? He said, well, I didn't know it at the time. But I realize now that when I drove in, there was a car running. As I got out of the car, I could hear that the car next to me was running and there was a guy in the driver's seat. I said, okay. He said, I walked inside and, and I, I saw the guy behind the counter. And normally they look at you and size you up. But he just looked at me for a split second and took all his attention back to another one of the customers. And he just stared at that customer. And that was very unusual. I know it now, but I didn't know it then. And then he said, plus that customer I now know was, you know, wearing a big heavy jacket. And I realize now, but I didn't realize then it was a hot day. And so I think I put all that together and I left the store. So here's the part of Bob Thompson's story that's not accurate, which is if he knows it now, if it's in his head now, it was in his head then. And so here's a guy who, without debate, without prosecution, without hesitation, felt absolute fear, didn't even uh, you know, question it, uh, and, and didn't go to political correctness, and didn't go to the, the more common thing we go to, which is, hey, I want to finish my plans, right? I, I want to get my, the Coca-Cola I'm here to get. Uh, and so instead just went to a different convenience store four or five blocks away, got the stuff and forgot about the whole experience until he saw the news that night. And by the way, why did the policeman not intuit the same thing when he came into the store about five minutes, we now know from video, about five minutes after Robert Thompson did? Because the policeman, when he looked at the guy behind the counter, what he saw was relief. He didn't see somebody staring at somebody else. And, and then that policeman, he knew that daytime robberies are very rare. So he walks around the, the store without basically having his intuition in gear, listening to a statistical irrelevancy, like daytime robberies are more rare than nighttime robberies, and he got shot and killed. And so the, the, the point here is that your story, which you know, feels like nothing, right? Guy came to your house to fix the cables, but you changed that story. I'm not saying he was going to rob the house. We don't know the answer. But what we do know is that your behavior was a variable that changed that experience, no matter what his intention was, whether it was to grab a watch off a counter or whether it was to set fire to the house and, and steal everything you own, who the hell knows? But the point is, you changed it. And, and so what happens is by that tiny change, what you brought to the relationship with that cable guy, it wasn't it. You didn't bring a gun or a baseball bat or anything like that. You said, hey, buddy, look over here. I've got a human brain that is the most powerful resource in human history. And I'm the latest model of this human being. You know, I'm the 2017 living model. And in effect, the look you gave him back and the awareness that you showed him by your posture and your body and your stance and 
everything you did was armor. And it was the, you know, the, the look that communicated, I don't mean in a mean way, but your entire being communicated, don't fuck with me today. And that's a lot. That's a big message for somebody to get. Well, so I, I want to flip this perhaps at least seemingly paradoxically because there are, we've been talking about how good and reliable human intuition is here in detecting danger and that, and that the fear signal is always worth taking seriously on some level when it's fear that has a proximate cause in, in your environment. But there are other ways in which people's intuitions around violence reliably fail them. And there, there, there are ways in which people are easily manipulated by bad actors. And you, you describe some of this in your book, but I'll just give you one example of, of the kind of thing that, that people seem pretty bad at. I mean, so, so when, when they are, you know, suddenly made the victim of violence or become aware that, you know, violence is, is in the offing, you know, say you're, say you're getting into your car and, you know, someone shows up at your side with a gun and says, get in. So many people, it seems, see no alternative in those moments but to comply with someone, to trust that the psychopath that has now just come out of the woodwork will do what he promises to do. So in this case, you know, if you just let yourself be moved to a secondary crime scene, everything will be okay. So people, you know, in the, to stick with this example, people's primary concern is, above all, don't get shot. So to run away or to, or, or, or to slam your car into a tree or whatever it is that would prevent you from being moved to a secondary crime scene. So that's a behavior they can't access because they're so afraid of getting shot. They're so afraid of getting killed that they want to trust that this person who is now has complete power over them is going to be the good guy he says he'll be if only they comply. So I want to talk a little bit about the way in which people are reliably manipulated by, you know, psychopaths in this case, or people who are somewhere on that continuum. So just to ping your memory here, in your book, you talk about things like unsolicited promises and forced teaming and too much information and, and the fact that this person picked you. And so just, I just, I just want to push you in the direction of that, those kinds of considerations in your answer, because in talking to people about this and just in, in knowing what it was like to be me before I became a student of human violence, much of what happens after that first moment of fear can be fairly counterintuitive. Yes, it's very, it's very true. And there are strategies of human predation that are, um, you know, very easy to see once you know those particular pieces of the puzzle. And, and you mentioned, uh, for example, the unsolicited promise. I'll just jump right into that one. Uh, you know, if somebody says, as one of the people that I interviewed in the book uh, who, who was raped but ultimately not killed by a man who had killed another one of his victims, and she used some rather extraordinary strategies for dealing with uh, her safety, and she listened to her intuition, well, in that case, he, he was helping her carry groceries up, to, up some flights of stairs to her apartment. And at the apartment door, she said, and she'd already been uncomfortable with him, she said, um, I'll take it from here. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll put the stuff down on the counter and then I'll go, I promise. And that's called an unsolicited promise. And, and the, you know, what an unsolicited promise is, is it's a way of saying to you, if you listen to it this way, I can see you doubt me. And so I'm going to make a promise. A promise, of course, is not a commitment or a guarantee or anything like that. A promise is an instrument of communication designed to, to, to diminish your, your uncertainty. The easiest example would be my 16-year-old son says, you know, can I borrow the car, Dad? I'll have it back by 11. I promise. Or the, the, you know, the guy on the street who's asking for money says, I won't buy alcohol with this. I promise. Well, we laugh at those promises. We, we realize those promises are ridiculous, but all of a sudden, in a situation with a predator, too many of us listen to it. And another one, by the way, a, a big one, particularly in, in uh, relationships between men and women, and notice I use the word relationship, because with a stranger, you have a relationship. If he's in your environment, you have a relationship. Uh, if somebody's offering to you know, help you with your groceries in your underground parking lot, you have a relationship. And like every other relationship, you've got to decide if you want it or not. And so uh, 
another one of the signals or predatory strategies is uh, charm or niceness. You know, it's an, my view, it is an overrated ability. And, and note that I call charm an ability. It's not an inherent feature of somebody's personality. Charm is a directed instrument. It's like rapport building. To charm somebody is to compel or to control them by some kind of allure or attraction. And I encourage people to think of charm as a verb, not a trait. So when somebody says to me, uh, you know, oh, I met this really charming guy. And I say, well, when did you see that he was trying to charm you? Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a verb. And uh, so among all the signals, this one, charm and niceness, is the one that tends to destabilize or distract uh, victims the most often. You know, he's such a nice guy. He looked like such a nice guy. He acted like such a nice guy. Well, how would somebody act who wants you to get in their car other than to act nicely? And so we, we have to learn and teach our children as well that niceness, which is a choice, does not equal goodness. Niceness is a strategy. And people seek to control others always by being nice at the beginning. The husband who ultimately beats up his wife and kills his wife, do you think he was not nice on their first date? It, it's a rapport building instrument, basically, of communication and of behavior. And there's a, a super dark humor. I love dark humor, by the way poem, a rhyme by Edward Gorey, the kind of master of dark humor. And uh, he says, the proctor buys the pupil ices and hopes the boy will not resist when he attempts to practice vices few people even know exist. So the proctor buys the pupil ices, right? He buys him some ice cream. Uh, it's the most obvious thing in the world. But his intention is not for the nutrition of his, uh, of, of his companion. His intention is to persuade, the, in this case, the child, that he's a nice person. And so personality, this is going to go a little deeper, but personality itself is a vehicle for self-advancement, right? Personality is a technology. You know, some people are warm and, uh, you know, convivial, and, and some people are a little bit uh, more standoffish, and there's all variety of, of ways in which people behave. But what I encourage women to do. I'm talking here about women because they get victimized more often by these strategies is to, you know, explicitly rebuff unwanted approaches. And that is something the entire culture has told them never to do. Never be rude, never be cold, never be a bitch. And, and so what, what I have really seen in my career, hard to believe for a lot of people, but important to believe is that, you know, I've studied so many uh, incidents of victimization and all of the behaviors that led up to them on the part of the victim and on the part of the predator. And the, the, the key here is that first and foremost, a woman feel free to rebuff and resist and be a bitch in effect, because I have never seen that lead to violence ever. Have I seen that a stranger's choice to tell somebody, I don't want your help, leave me alone, is the reason that they were victimized. But I've seen thousands of cases where the reason they were victimized is that they allowed someone to stay in their environment. I want to pick up on some of these specific points. You're different than some other people I've studied here in, the, in that there are very few areas where you think that it's helpful to have a hard and fast rule in your head you know, that, that does not admit of any exceptions. I basically agree with that. The one, the one bright line for me that, uh, I mean, maybe there are exceptions, but they seem so remote and the bias in a state of real fear to hope that you're one of those exceptions seems so strong that I'm tempted to recommend it as a rule without exception. And it is around this issue of being moved to a secondary crime scene. Is it the moment someone is trying to exert control over you in that way, and to take you elsewhere, which is almost by definition a place where you're less likely to find help. That's the moment where, and many people recommend this, and I'm not sure you do, that should trigger 100% resistance, and you should just assume it's never going to get easier to resist than at that moment. Do you, do you agree with that, or do, you, or do you know important exceptions to that rule? 
No, I, I agree with it completely. And by the way, even if I could identify some exceptions and I've had enough, you know, study of enough cases that I can always find exceptions. But uh, even if I did, um, statistically and in my gut, um, I, that is one I believe in entirely. I want to, as I endorse that, Sam, I want to tell you why I resist rules in general. Um, because, uh, you know, magazine articles love the 10 ways to get a better apartment, the five ways to avoid violence, the 10 ways to be sure you never get so-and-so, and you, and you memorize these things, uh, you know, and imagine that by, by rote, somehow they will apply to your situation and they won't. Uh, they won't, you know, reliably so. And so what I say to people is I'm not going to be there with you. So I'm not going to pretend to say, cross the street when there's a bad guy on your side of the street. Why not? Why would I not believe in that rule? Because maybe there's 10 bad guys on the other side of the street. Or maybe you're about to come to the police department and you're going to cross the street to go over to where the homeless shelter is. The point being here that none of those rules can work and, and the comedy of that particular one. And people say it all the time. You know, men say to their girlfriends, you should have crossed the street. Do they think the crossing the street requires a passport? You're suddenly in a different country. It's just crossing the street. Your able-bodied predator will gladly go with you. And so that's what I don't like about rules is that they make people believe that the rule on its own will protect them. And I, I have three exceptions to this. And the one you just mentioned is one of them. One of them is that you know, uh, the golden rule of parenting for many years when it comes to safety uh, was never talk to strangers, teach your kids never to talk to strangers. And I strongly oppose that rule. Because if your kids are ever lost in public, what is the one resource they're going to need? The ability to talk to strangers. And so stranger is not the issue. Strangeness is the issue. And so I very much believe in teaching kids to engage with people and then talking with them is I've got 10 kids, by the way, so I've been through this a lot, talking to them, your kids afterwards and saying, what did you feel about that person? Like, go, you ask what time it is. You ask where the nearest ice cream store is. What did you feel about that person? I didn't like him, Papa. Why not? I don't know. He didn't seem like a nice guy. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. You're teaching them about listening to their own internal voice. So I don't believe in never talk to strangers. And I do believe in teaching kids to talk to strangers. And then the other one I, I absolutely oppose that's equally as common is uh, go to a policeman. Hey, if you're ever in trouble, Bobby, go to a policeman. The problem with telling a four-year-old to go to a policeman is, you know, they're 24 inches off the ground and they go to a security guard instead or they can't figure it out. And you don't want to go to a security guard. I can promise you that, you know, many, too many rapes and too many homicides come from that employment pool. And so what you really want to teach kids, this is the second rule, I would say, for everything, and it applies to adults as well, is when you need help, go to a woman. Select a woman. A woman is not going to accidentally, by the worst twist of fate, be your predator. And a woman is going to help a child to reconnect with their parents. And a woman is not going to be, as I say, by, by, by the worst luck of the draw, uh, you know, your, your child molester. And so go to a woman. It's better than go to a stranger. Uh, drop the nonsense about never talk to strangers. And now I'm coming to the one you've mentioned, which is really the big one. And that is never allow yourself to be taken to a secondary location. But I can enhance that one a bit by saying that whatever the person orders you to do, do the opposite. And I teach my kids this. Somebody yells, don't scream, scream. Somebody says, don't move, move. Why? Because he is telling you, I'm saying he instead of she, forgive the political incorrectness, but men are more violent than women in every culture, in, in, all, in all times in history. So um, because he is telling you that screaming will help you and it will disadvantage me. He is telling you that moving will help you and it will disadvantage me. So fuck listening to him like people do in a movie. You know, somebody aims a gun at you. Hey, get in the car. Fuck you, get in the car. I'm not getting in the car. I'm going to take my chances on running, which, by the way, a lot of people are afraid to do because they think that armed person will do what? Shoot, Shoot them. them. Yes. That's right. Now, what they don't know, and, and you do know as somebody more skilled and more familiar with firearms, is that shooting somebody who's zigzagging away from you when you didn't expect it to happen is actually a very unlikely thing to succeed at, and it doesn't advance the intention of the predator. Because if he just wanted to shoot you, he'd have shot you already. He had you in a better position when you were listening to him at the beginning. 
His purpose is not to shoot you. His purpose is to, what he told you his purpose, get in the car. So you don't get in the car and you basically act and your fear will tell you what to do, by the way, if you listen. Sometimes the predatory, I mean, the best strategy for dealing with a predator, we can look at nature. Sometimes it's freeze. Uh, sometimes it's run. Whatever your predator tells you to do, you want to do the opposite. And, and, and is it worth trying to run away from somebody? Sometimes. It's, you know, I say I won't be there with you. So sometimes the right thing to do if you're, for example, being uh, you know, told at gunpoint and you can see you're about to be raped, sometimes the right thing to do is comply and wait for the right opportunity to resist. Sometimes the right thing to do is resist right now. Sometimes the right thing to do is a mixture of compliance and resistance. But all the time, the right thing to do is remember, this I say to women particularly, that you are an animal of nature. And you are imbued with some very dangerous objects called hands and feet and teeth. And so all the women in my career, I, you know, I used to give a lot of talks, speeches around the country. I don't do it much anymore. But I would talk about the fact that everybody has the resource of the ability to kill. It's one of the options. And invariably, somebody would raise their hand and say, I, I would never kill anybody, usually a woman. I would never kill anybody. It's just not in my nature. And, and, uh, but she will add dot, 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 unless somebody tries to hurt one of my kids. And then she would stab, rip, burn, shoot, bite, uh, it, all bets are off, right? Well, I'm trying to encourage women, particularly in the culture and teenage girls, particularly bring your best resources to the table at the earliest possible moment and know that what you would do for a child, uh, you too are a child of somebody. Do it for yourself. Bring all those resources. So, Sam, I know that's a super long download, but I just want to say I endorse the idea of never go to a secondary note location, and I broaden it to say never participate in any bad guy's plan. There, there are enough exceptions that I still say, and I'm going to come, I'm going to come back around to where you are, but I still say that the listening to intuition in the moment is going to be the most important thing. There's, there can be a tiny detail you know that you don't even know you know, which is going to make it valuable for you, for example, a real woman interviewed in The Gift of Fear, uh, who's now a dear friend of mine. She's in a car, she closes her car door, and she immediately feels fear. She puts the car in gear to drive away, and, what she, and the, somebody opens the car door on the other side and jumps in, and what she was reacting to was seeing a tiny uh, image in the side view mirror on the passenger side of Levi's, of jeans, of denim, where it should have been some expanse. Somebody was standing that close to the mirror, right? Now, he got in the car, and he said, drive, and she was already in gear, and she elected to continue driving. Ra he had a gun, by the way. She elected to continue driving rather than try to get out, because on her side, Cars were so close to her, moving at such speed that it was her wish to continue driving. Now, ultimately, her story ends very well. She had a lot of options. She had the option to crash the car. She had a seatbelt on, and he didn't. She had the option to talk to him and, and, and suss out what was up. And ultimately, she, you could say, talked her way out of it. Now, is that the norm? No. And you would say statistically, but I hate statistics, but statistically, um, she'd have been wiser to do something else, whatever it may be. But she already had her seatbelt on, and she just didn't feel she could pull it off. Now, but here's where I want to say where I agree with you completely. Learn the universal code of violence. This is said slightly more to men, to women rather than to men, but it applies to both. And that is there is a universal code of violence. You know 90% of it, but if you learn the rest of it, which falls into the category of preparation, you enhance not only your chances of, of prevailing in a predation situation, but you'll actually be vastly less afraid. And please don't let us end without me talking about the fact that th the destination here is much less unwarranted fear and much less paranoia. But, but here's what I want to say about, about preparation. There's a training style called impact. Uh, I'm, I used to be on their board of directors. It's something I believe in very much for women and for men. And it's training with the instructors uh, use padded assailants. And you, and you really are attacked and you really do strike with your full force. Something that men have done many times in their life, throughout their lives, in sports or in real fights. But most women have never done. 
Most women have never struck another person with their full force, and they have never resisted in the ways that you're taught to resist in impact training. So I don't know what city every listener is in, of course, but you look up impact and, and impact training and you find it somewhere. That's a very valuable form of training because it gives you the muscle memory of resisting. And physical resistance is someone that most women, something that most women believe will put them in greater risk. Now I want to talk about preparation. If you don't think about this, and if you think that denial is a strategy that will come to your rescue in the event of, of some dramatic situation, or if you send your kids off to college, uh, particularly women, without uh, you know, reading the gift of fear and, and learning about things and taking impact training and doing other things that, that are valuable, it's a huge mistake. And here's why. A lot of people say to me, I don't even want to think about this topic. And my response is, do you imagine that not thinking about it is an effective resource in an emergency? Or do you imagine that not thinking about it is somehow a magic amulet that will make it less likely? And the reality is that you know people say, I don't even want to think about my kid being uh, sexually molested. Really? You don't even want to learn about the fact that sexual molestation is actually far more likely by a heterosexual man than by a homosexual man. You don't want to learn about the fact that sexual molestation is far more likely to happen by somebody you bring into the house, not by a stranger in some dark alley. You just don't want to know. Is that your answer to this? Well, if that's your answer to this, basically you're talking to the wrong guy because I'm not going to participate in that illusion, which is that you know you want to be the guy who is. Um, trying to, to, to swim in the ocean, but what you want to do is act like you're still sitting in your stateroom and this yacht has sunken. The, the point of being is, is that people who want to do that, and believe me, a lot do, um, they are the best victims in the world. They participate willingly and fully, and they make predators very, very happy. And, and since I use the word a lot, predator, let's go to nature. And in nature, there are predators with magnificent strategies that uh, are brilliant, and there are uh, prey with magnificent strategies for avoiding being eaten, for example. And yet every day, millions of times, predators fail and vice versa. Why? Why is that happening? Because it is a race. And in the arms race, uh, what we don't want is detente. In, you don't want to bring detente to the arms race with the predator who's got you in the underground parking lot, and he's got the two things that all predators want. And, and this is what I call, I, I, I hate PC, hate PC. That could be a whole podcast one day. And, and I hate it directly related to my work, violence. But I changed pre PC to uh, use it for the words privacy and control. And it's something I teach all teenage girls and, and women going off to college, both through my books and, and in, in the case of my own two daughters. When somebody has privacy and control, when you're in an environment where there's privacy, meaning nobody will hear you if you call for help, and there's control, meaning you hand this person control because he's either big or strong or scary, or he's the, the driving instructor in the car with you, but he's driving, he's telling you to drive to distant places. When any, he's the boss who says, hey, let's close up early tonight, and you're in the locked building with just him. Privacy and control is the first thing that ought to tell you, not that he's bad. It has nothing to do with the, with the person who's with you. It has only to do with your vulnerability. In this circumstance, you're more vulnerable. So what do you do with that information? Do you run home? No. Your boss may be the greatest guy in the world, and the, and, and the driving instructor in the car in the remote part of the community may be the greatest guy in the world. You just pay attention on a different level. That's all I ask people to do is recognize I'm in a shit situation here if there is any predation to happen. And so if this is a bad guy, it doesn't mean that all guys are bad. Of course, they're not. And it doesn't mean that you're in danger. Of course, you're not. 99% of the time, you're not. But PC is one of my rules, which is if you, if you sense it, and we do this in public figure protection, if I sense that, ah, a lot of tall buildings, and suddenly in a circumstance, we're very far from the car, we've got to walk across this open space, uh, there's 10,000 people crowding around who are angry at our protectee. And uh, so this is a circumstance where we don't have advantages. We don't have the ACE, you know, what I call the ACE, access cover and escape. We don't have it. We don't have access to our protectee. We don't have nearby cover and we don't have escape strategy. So you, you, you handle that situation differently and you speed through it, right? You, you get through that circumstance fast. So speaking of fast, I know I'm talking fast here because I want to be sure not to lose the kangaroo story. So if, with your permission, I want to tell the kangaroo story real quick. 
This has to do with what you said a minute ago about informing your intuition. That's your responsibility. You have to get accurate information and inform yourself. So if you're a woman, like how many people didn't read The Gift of Fear because it sounds scary? Uh, well, this book is not going to bite you and, and, and it's not going to rape you and it's not going to victimize you in any way. Information you're afraid of, maybe it's not the book for you. That's fine. But the broader point I want to talk about is the kangaroo story. So I give talks at the CIA and I used to give them a lot more often, but I still do them occasionally because CIA officers overseas have to rely on one thing above all else, intuition. And I tell them the kangaroo story. And the story about the kangaroo is that kangaroos attack very rarely human beings, but when they do attack, it's brutal and very dangerous. And they always give three reliable pre-incident indicators. The first one is that they always look behind them and around them because they're clumsy and after they attack, they like to retreat quickly. Uh, the second one is that they always bare their teeth. And uh, uh, tourists in Australia think, well, they're smiling, look how sweet. And then the third one is they always check their pouch because if they have uh, offspring in their pouch, they won't attack. And so if you remember those three pre-incident indicators about kangaroos, you'll never be victim of a kangaroo attack. But the problem with those three incident, pre-incident indicators is that I made them up. They are bullshit. So if you're ever really facing a kangaroo, forget that I said that. Here's why I do it. I did it at a talk with the CIA. And then I asked the audience members an hour later when I was done, can anybody here name the three pre-incident indicators of kangaroo attack? And every hand goes up because you will never forget those three pre-incident indicators of kangaroo attack. Why? I recommend you not do this in Australia because there's this other thing called the illusory truth effect, which is a, another bug in human cognition, which is even though you're telling this story and the, the whole point is to emphasize that this is not true, some significant percentage of people will remember it as being true. So who knows what harm you've been doing exactly. these many years, yeah. Gavin? Millions of readers undermine. But, but here's the, so here's the reason that's so important, is that as silly, I just downloaded into people's intuition the kangaroo pre-incident indicators. Well, the news media is constantly giving you false pre-incident indicators. They're using, you know, flashy newsy stories that are actually incredibly rare. I'll give you a stupid example, stupid on their part, not my part. Uh, you know, they're interviewing people. Uh, there's, a, there's a rapist in a park. He's a serial rapist. He's attacked 15 women in a small community, and he just got arrested. And he's, he's arrested, and he's going to be convicted. He's confessed, and he's going to be imprisoned. And they interview people around the park. Well, I'm never going into this park again. Um, I, I was always a little afraid, but I'm never coming here. You mean the day that the rapist is caught? This is the day that the news media wants to go and, and make you more afraid about the drama of, uh, of rape in the park? My point is, you have a responsibility to load your intuition with accurate information. And you will not get that from television news uh, because things that are news are inherently unusual. That's why they're there. If, if it were any other way, Sam, there'd be 20 reports about uh, spousal homicide every day on the news. But that's not what there is. There's the, the, the snake that ate the dog in the neighborhood. That happens all of once in human history. You don't have to load your intuition with that crap Dogs are far more dangerous to snakes than the other way around. But, the, but I'm just strongly endorsing what you said, that we have an obligation to accurately inform our intuition. And that's why educating yourself on the topic of violence is better than hope or wishing uh, or denial. Gavin, you mentioned one thing that I, I want to emphasize, which is that focusing on this, becoming a, a student of human violence need not make you dark, need not make you more worried than you otherwise were. In fact, it has the opposite effect in, in uh, I think, most of us. I mean, first of all, training for anything, you know, training in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu or doing an impact course or you know, even learning to use firearms, it may be fear that got you there. But once you actually do any of these things, they're just incredibly fun and empowering. And you just feel you feel better about yourself in the world. And it's just any one of these things can become a, a guilty pleasure. So the, the experience of arming yourself, both conceptually and physically, is not morbid and is not, it doesn't serve to increase fear. It, it, it's quite the opposite. It's absolutely true that people avoid 
like crazy a lot of this information because they assume that uh, it'll make them paranoid or as you said it'll make them dark or what have you but i make a promise in my more public books that uh, you will be less afraid at the end of this book than at the beginning because you've educated yourself on the topic imagine somebody you know you get a diagnosis of cancer well that's pretty scary uh, but your response to that diagnosis is not I never want to hear another word about cancer. The last thing I want to do is learn anything about cancer. What actually gets you through that experience is learning about cancer and learning about what you can do and learning about the treatment plans and, and all of that. So being a victim of violence and being a prospective victim of violence is a bit like having a, a virus that you want to treat. And the way you treat that anxiety or fear is by learning something about it. So if you think about it, uh, you know, uh, given the frenzy uh, and the power of all the various violence industries like, uh, you know, media and the gun industries and what have you, the amazing part is how rarely we hurt each other. You know, Abraham Lincoln talked about the better angels of our nature, and I think it's how we get through every day with cooperation. And we've already survived, all of us, these extraordinary risks, because in mo modern world, Every day, we're moving you know, in and around powerful machines that could kill us and uh, uh, airplanes that could crash and subways and buses and elevators and escalators and all of this stuff. We, our homes are wired up with lethal uh, uh, you know, amounts of electricity and their gas is pumped into our homes. And all these things go on. And, and, and the most frightening of all of them is that we live among you know, angry countrymen and sometimes armed and angry. I mean, if you take it all together, these are things every day that our ancestors would shudder at. You bring somebody from a thousand years ago here, and, and this is a very confusing and fast-paced and sort of dangerous place. And so I, I, I want to say that on the, it comes from Mark Twain, you know that quote where he says, I've had a great many troubles in my life, but most of them never happened. I'm not recommending to people that they worry, but if you know a great deal about predicting and avoiding violence. And if you know about the dangers that are posed by strangers or by friends or what have you, when your intuition is better informed, I am absolutely certain from now 40 years of this that people have less unwarranted fear of other people because you know that you'll get the fear signal if you need it. And 99% of the time we walk around, you and I are in a restaurant together, fear doesn't even enter into our thinking. And, uh, but if it does, you want to listen, and it'll be it'll be super rare. And I think the result of educating yourself on the nature of predatory strategies, how people behave, uh, what are the pre-incident indicators of various forms of violence, I think the result is that people live far less afraid because the nagging knowledge that, gee, I'm in this world and I don't know anything about this world, that is the cause of anxiety. Information is not the cause of anxiety. Yeah, well, so I, I, before we close, uh, there are a few more topics I want to hit, and there's one that we haven't talked about. We've talked about the unique risk that, that women live under, but uh, we haven't specifically talked about domestic violence. And you have a very provocative quote somewhere where you say, the first time a woman gets hit, she's a victim. The second time, she's a volunteer. So I want you to justify that point and tell our women listeners what you think they should know about this topic. It need not be narrowly focused on domestic violence, but anything you think women in particular should know. Probably the smartest thing for me to do when I reflect on that quote from Gift of Fear, the first time a woman is hit, she's a victim, and the second time she's a volunteer, probably the smartest thing for me to do is say, I never said that, because it is indeed controversial, and it does get often a reaction, uh, I'm blaming the victim or what have you. And I want to answer this very quickly because what people say is, gee, Gavin, you don't understand the syndrome of what a woman is going through in a domestic violence situation. In fact, I have a deep and personal understanding of the syndrome from my own childhood, and yet I never pass up an opportunity to tell women that staying is a choice. Staying is a choice. And for those who argue that it's not a choice, meaning that it's a syndrome that you're locked into that you can't possibly change, then I ask the question, is it a choice when a woman finally does decide to leave? Or is there some syndrome to explain leaving? 
And I believe it's really critical for women to view staying as a choice because that's the only way you can view getting out as a choice. And, and one more quick note, because I, I expect a, a controversial reaction to this quote all the time, is that if we dismiss a woman's participation as being beyond choice, uh, then what about the man? Couldn't we point to his childhood and his insecurities and his shaky identity and his addiction, you know, and his controlling ways and say, that's a syndrome too, and it's beyond his choice, and how could we blame him in that circumstance? Basically, every human behavior can be explained by what precedes it, but that does not excuse it, and we have to hold abusive men accountable, for sure, but whoever we blame, and I'm going to quote you on this because you said earlier, you know, staying in that environment, uh, just not being there is the first order of, of safety, right? Don't be there. Well, whoever we blame, there is some responsibility on both sides of the gender line, particularly if there are children involved, because both parents who participate in a violent relationship are hurting their kids. I think the man is hurting the kids more than the woman, but both are participating. And children who grow up in those situations are often angry at their mothers. Why? Because they stayed, because they didn't protect them and what have you. And so there's a woman, it's worth it, it's a quick story, a woman I interviewed, and, and uh, she was a victim of domestic violence. Uh, I had helped her through a certain circumstance. Her husband was actually shot her, and she survived, and, and he was now in prison. And now her daughter, 19 years old, was also in a violent relationship, and she was talking to me about it. And, uh, and she said, here's what I'm going to do. And I said to her, you know, what's the difference between you two years ago and your daughter? You wouldn't do it for yourself two years ago, but you'll do it for your daughter now. And she says, well, my daughter has me. And I said, right, and you didn't have you, right? You, you were alone in that regard. You abandoned yourself. And so I'm ready for everybody who wants to say that the, that the concept that the first time a woman is hit, she's a victim, and the second time she's a volunteer is an awful and politically incorrect concept and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I believe in it very strongly that we need to teach people that you are you have options and that you are responsible for your own safety. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that, it's, that, it's, that, that it is sometimes insurmountable. For example, as a kid, I, I never thought about leaving. No matter how much violence I experienced, it never even entered my thinking. And because I didn't know it was an option. And that's why I don't want to leave other people, including anybody listening to this, believing that it's not an option to leave because as you know, children learn from modeling. So as the mother accepts the blows, so likely might her daughter. And as the father delivers the blows, so likely might his son. And I've got a case with three generations in a row, father, son, and grandson, who all killed their wives. And all three men grew up observing the violence in their household among their, uh, you know, among their, their parents. And uh, I, I'll just close this uh, download with a, with a uh, and I hope it's a passionate download because I mean it to be, that Helen Keller, who had another type of trap she was in, uh, you know, blind and deaf, and uh, because being in a violent relationship can feel like a kind of trap, she said, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of suffering. And, and so I, I want to encourage anybody, it's obvious, if you're in a relationship that includes violence and you ever believe that you're at risk of being killed, that's not the place to be. Right, right. And there's one, one practical detail here, which, again, many people are misled about and you have a fairly strong position on. What is the utility, generally speaking, of a restraining order in a situation like this where you're worried you're going to get killed by your spouse or the boyfriend who's stalking you? Or, or the estranged spouse or what have you. So, so restraining orders are a valuable instrument that, that make things much, much easier in these situations for the police, right? They make it much better for the police, no question about it. And if you're using a piece of paper to stop someone you think is using bullets, uh, then, then you've got the wrong defense system, basically. And it is uh, studied very, very clearly now and written about in, a lot in my books, but also plenty of other uh, research projects that, uh, that restraining orders are valid and valuable in cases where the men 
I'll, I'll choose men, obviously it could be men or women in any kind of gender relationship, but where the men uh, are not committed to homicide and feel they have something to lose. Once committed to homicide or committed to not losing the wife, you know, you will not leave me, um, then the restraining order is not, uh, is not the best uh, uh, response. And I'll tell you that lawyers and police and TV news people and counselors and psychologists and even some victims advocates, not many these days, recommend restraining orders wholesale. Uh, I have joked that it, you know, it's a growth industry in America. You, we should put it on the New York Stock Exchange, but we should stop telling people that a piece of paper will automatically protect them because when you apply it to a certain type of man, it does the opposite. It is enraging and provocative. And you know, it, it's obvious to say it won't restrain a murderer, but there's controversy on the topic of how police use it because a woman comes into the police department, she makes a complaint, and he says, oh, you know, go ahead and fill out these papers. Have you got a restraining order? And uh, she says, no, well, you got to get a restraining order. Well, the reality is that that choice has caused many women to be killed who wouldn't have been. And, and when, I, uh, when Gift of Fear came out, uh, a prosecutor wrote me a letter. I knew him, and he, he wrote me this impassioned letter about how, how he found that the section on domestic violence was so helpful, but it broke his heart because he realized how many times as a prosecutor he had told people to get restraining orders. And uh, so I want to just give you a quick stat. San Diego District Attorney's Office, they did a study of 179 stalking cases, and half of the victims who had gotten restraining orders felt that the cases were worsened by them. And uh, so what does worsened mean? Well, worsened means an escalation of violence and risk. So they simply, they are right for some cases. I want to make that clear. But they are not right for every case. They're not a prescription. And the perfect analogy is given to us by medicine, which is obviously aspirin is a tremendous drug, very valuable for blood thinning. It'll fix your headache. It's absolutely fantastic. But for a few people, aspirin will kill you. So the question isn't, is aspirin a good or bad drug? The question is, which people is it good for? And which people is it good, you know, bad for? And in spousal homicide cases, the number of cases, like I'll tell you a true one now, a woman named Shirley Lowry, she was waiting outside the courtroom for the restraining order hearing, and she was stabbed 19 times by her husband. Or another woman who, who, who the police told her after she'd gotten nine restraining orders, they said that the, what she should do is get another restraining order, right? Or this woman, Betsy Murray, her husband violated the restraining order 13 times. And he reacted to her divorce petition by telling her marriage is for life and the only way out of marriage is death. And so when nothing else worked and when the cops kept telling her to get a restraining order, she went into hiding. And even after the police assured her that her husband had fled the country, they were wrong. He was due to be arrested for violating the restraining order. And remember, uh, he'd violated it 13 times already. She got a new address. And at some point, she got lazy about you know, keeping her, her uh, information secret. And her estranged husband found her and killed her and then herself. Now, I literally, Sam, could do our entire podcast for a month with stories like that. And so the restraining order should never be an automatic knee-jerk reaction. It is not the solution. And the problem with it is, or the last problem with it is, that it makes people feel they solve the problem. Yeah. So now, uh, quickly, what do you think about guns for self-defense? People owning guns who take everything we've been talking about seriously, is that, can you generalize about uh, your view on that, or is it really totally dependent on the person? Well, it's, it's dependent, you know, asking what I think about guns, and I obviously get the question a lot, is a little bit like asking what I think about cars. Um, I think they're awesome. You know, cars are fantastic, but I don't want my 10-year-old driving mine. And so the issue is, to what degree does the owner and user of a gun uh, train himself or herself and prepare for this particular technology? If you don't train yourself for it, then I have to hit you with statistics, right? 75 times more likely that somebody in your family will be shot than an intruder will be shot. Things like that are, are, you know, are unignorable, but they change according to, you know, again, it's like asking me, what do you think about surgery? I think it's great, but I don't want it done by my 10-year-old. And so the, the issue here entirely boils down 
to uh, who's using it and how well have they prepared themselves for it. And, uh, you, you know, a gun in the home is an enormous responsibility. It is not a consumer product that you go and you buy for $400 and you put it in your house and now you're safe. Uh, it, it just isn't like that. And so uh, the idea that you can buy it and put it in the, in the drawer, you know, next to your bed and everything's okay without really familiarizing yourself with how it operates, just like you did with the car, uh, with how to use it, just like you do with the stove and the oven and the power drill and everything else you've got in the house and having a strategy for keeping it away from children. Because what I don't advocate gun control, I advocate what I call bullet control meaning where do the bullets go? That's what I'm concerned about. The gun on its own is, is a piece of metal like anything else. But the gun in the hands of a nine-year-old boy, uh, that's a really serious thing. And so what I strongly recommend is that people learn about guns if they're going to have them. And if they make that decision to have it in their home, that they take the kind of responsibility that they are, you know, that they are obligated to take when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to anything dangerous. And, uh, you know, a gun is a technology that outlives the consumer that buys it. And so one has to recognize that it's not going anywhere. It's going to be in your house for a long time. And the number one responsibility you have is to keep it away from children. And people say to me sometimes, oh, you know, I don't have kids, so it's no problem. It's still a problem because the plumber you call on a Saturday afternoon to come and, and fix something in your house, you're going to bring along his nine-year-old son, and, and he's going to find it in the house. And the point is that if safety is your concern, a gun is a tremendous resource, just like a car is a tremendous resource, but a gun without education is like a scalpel without education. And I don't want anybody getting near me with a scalpel uh, unless they've got a degree in surgery. And I think that's the that, that's the most uh, organized view I can yeah. give you of, of guns. One other point I would just echo there is that there are many gun owners even who are under the impression that you can't store a gun safely, which is to say locked up so that only you have access to it, and have that still be compatible with your getting it quickly in an emergency. And that's just not at all true. It can be locked up with only you having access to it. and there are now safes that you can access so quickly that it's almost like the gun is sitting out on your shelf. If you're down to hundreds of milliseconds that's uh, making the difference, you're in a pretty rare circumstance of self-defense. Uh, and what you probably need is an alarm system to give you, you know, early warning. All of the, the stories you hear about kids finding their parents' guns and killing themselves or their friends or their parents, these are just absolutely pointless tragedies that are not intrinsic to this technology in the way that car accidents are still currently intrinsic to the technology of driving cars. I mean, this is, these are every one of those deaths and injuries is just an instance of shocking negligence. And gun owners just have to get their heads straight around that. Well, here's the key point, though, on the issue you raised about people saying, if I put it in a safe, it's useless. I want you to operate something before you put your hand on a gun. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a woman written about in Gift of Fear who got up in the middle of the night and, and uh, uh, thinking that she was reaching for her asthma medicine, uh, picked the gun up from under the pillow and shot herself in the face. You do not want to go from being asleep to instantly driving an 18-wheeler at 70 miles an hour on the highway. So you actually want an instant to decide before you start firing rounds into the dark. <laughs> and, and so there's actually, this is a double safety element to a gun lock or a gun safe or any of the technologies that exist for securing weapons in the house. Um, and that is that it, it gives you a moment to decide. You don't want the pilot waking up and hitting the first button he sees. You, you want the pilot to, to be awake and be ready. That's his job, but we can't be awake 24 hours. So locking the gun, securing the gun, is an obligation that I believe, and in many states it is, criminally negligent uh, if somebody gets hold of your gun and does harm. And the number of kids that are killed by guns, for example, in America last year, there were more kids, more people killed by toddlers than by terrorists. More people killed by toddlers than terrorists. And we give billions of dollars to the, to the fight against terrorism, and we give nothing to the need to develop better 
uh, better child safe guns and better child safe technologies and education about guns. I do believe, as you do, you ought to have to have a license. You ought to have to go through a training protocol in order to have a gun in the home. Uh, and and there, that would be a big improvement uh, if, if you know, politicians would ever be have the balls to counter anything about guns. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I feel the, the need to say in, in my own self-defense at the moment, that my position on guns is very difficult to state briefly, and it's something that is almost certainly still evolving, but I have a long blog post, and in fact, it's a blog post that I read on the podcast at one point. It's called The Riddle of the Gun, and lest you draw the impression that I am just straightforwardly pro-gun or anti-gun safety, or you uh, are very unlikely to understand my full position on the basis of what we just said. So on the one hand, I, I think they are important and occasionally indispensable means of self-defense. But on the other hand, the kinds of controls I recommend are far more stringent than anyone who's lobbying for gun control and gun safety is uh, actually advancing at the moment. So it's a hard position to state. I want to I want to say something in your defense as well. You know, you're more famous than I am, and you you have more you have a larger audience, and accordingly you invite more controversy. Um, and and so on that topic, which is it's certainly one of the top three most polarizing topics in America. And any time there's a polarizing topic like a gun, what's called gun control or what's called abortion, um, those all have something in common. Death penalty. They all have something in common. And that is that people stop arguing about the actual elements of the subject. They're arguing about something quite different, our right to have a gun. Let's put that to bed right now. W whether it comes from, uh, from the Constitution or it doesn't, uh, we all ha we have a right to have guns. We don't get arrested for having guns in America. So all the people who want to argue endlessly about the right to bear arms, we have a right to bear arms. Forget where it comes from. We're living it every day, and that's where we live. I'm not making a political comment here. I'm making the only kind of comment I ever make which is one about reality. But I want to talk about your view. Your view is nuanced. And the moment it is, you don't fit into either camp and both camps hate you for it. And so the, the reality is, I, I read The Riddle of the Gun. I listened to it on the podcast as well. I'm with you. You begin with a beautiful foundation, which is you say everything I'm about to say would change completely and I would retract and revise if there were another technology that stopped people immediately uh, when they were acting in a way that wasn't viable for your safety. Meaning if there was something that was the Star Trek uh, stun gun, you'd say, let's use that instead. Uh, and, and so that is a, a nuanced position. And the reality is this. Um, we live in a country with more guns than adults. They are in the hands of people who will do you harm, and they are in the hands of people who will protect you. And, uh, you know, do you want cops not to have guns? I say to the people on one side of this, uh, of this controversy, uh, sure, we all want criminals to not have guns. I, I, I go a step further. Let's have criminals not have bad intentions. Uh, let's have criminals uh, uh, not want to be predators. There's a lot of things we'd like to have. But the reality is we live in a country with more guns than adults. And that means that our responsibility is to control how they're stored, how people are educated about them. Half the, America, half the people in America want guns. And so what I want to commit my energy to is not the debate about whether we can have gun control. We can't. Stop. We cannot confiscate guns in America in the way that it was done in Australia to great benefit. I want to make that point clear. Australia is better off for not having guns now than it was 18 years ago. I, I, I feel the same way about England, better off than it was 18, when it was uh, 27 years ago. The, and both of them in response to multiple victim shootings, by the way, and neither country has had one since. Neither country has had one since. So from that point of view, you'd say it's great. But can it work practically in America? Unfortunately, I've decided that my life isn't long enough to commit to the idea that I don't believe can actually happen. So I, I, I commend people to read the riddle of the gun and, and get off the, the uh, polarization element of it and get on the actual learning about the device and get on the actual learning about training and learning about storage, safe storage. That's my, my thing is all not gun control. My thing is entirely about gun access. I don't believe young kids should have access to guns under any circumstances, and, and that I, I'm ha very happy to go to war with anybody over, and that has nothing to do with whether they have a right to own a gun. Are there any other 
technologies now that change the way you've been thinking about violence or its prospects? Is there anything that, at one point you mentioned drones, weaponized drones in this conversation, which may sound completely insane to people, but there are, you know, there are recent reports from the last, uh, you know, the death rattle of, of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, where they have the drones of a sort your kids may be playing with, and they've weaponized them to, you know, blow up or, or to drop uh, hand grenades or mortars. Is there any, anything that, that people could be thinking about in terms of new ways to uh, inflict tissue damage that, that most of us haven't thought about? Oh, oh, yeah. And this is a big one. And, 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 you know, it doesn't really, in one sense, it doesn't matter what I say about this, because everybody's going to know about this soon enough in, in large measure. Uh, my company had a, a non-public uh, secret think tank uh, with people from many federal agencies and, and from the, the Pentagon and a wide variety of people who got together. And we now have a workshop group that studies uh, weaponized drones. And, and what I want to say, I say pretty bluntly, is that um, this is the most important uh, uh, technology advancement in in predatory action in homicide um, in a thousand years, and and the the technology of protection hasn't really changed a lot, and the protect technology of assassination hasn't really changed a lot. I would say the number one advancement in technology in assassination uh, would be the remote control bomb, and the number one advancement in technology of protection would be um, uh, lightweight body armor and and vehicle armor, although armor has of course existed, uh, you know, has existed forever, uh, thousands of years. People have used you know metal for armor and a wide variety of things. But I, I just quickly talk about the, you know, because there weren't huge advancements in assassination strategies for more than a thousand years, there were also weren't huge advancements in protection strategies. And so, for context, I want to give your listeners a very fast recap of how targeted tissue damage has been done throughout history. It's super fast. First was close quarters, body to body tissue damage, you know, hitting people, striking them, choking them. Next came heavy items like stones and rocks and heavy branches. Then came the introduction of intelligent or purpose-built tools and weapons like knives and swords. And then everything up to that point required proximity. You had to have some skin in the game. You had to get close. And that meant you had to have courage and commitment and be willing to take risks, which most people are not. The next development changed that because the next development in the hierarchy of tissue damage was distance weapons, like arrows and spears, for example. And distance tools are a huge advancement in, let's say, assassination because the attacker, and hunting, because the attacker doesn't need much of his own skin in the game. Poison is also a distance weapon. You didn't have to be there, right? You could put poison in ancient Rome. You could put poison in somebody's food and you could take off. But the big one was accelerated metal, cannonballs, bullets, and the wide variety of, of missiles that we've got. So over time, greater distance evolved and distance weapons meant that users could have almost no skin in the game. Uh, so a big one then was remote control or delayed detonation bombs. But finally, uh, you know, when remote control bombs came, that emerged as one of the most, and it remains, one of the most effective assassination strategies there is, particularly around the car. And now you have the biggest change uh, in a thousand years is the weaponized consumer drone because it trumps all this because it can do tissue damage with no skin in the game, you know, no, none of your skin in the game, no chance of being foiled, very difficult to, to uh, counter right now. And weapons that require no skin in the game profoundly expand the number of people who will be willing to use them. And so uh, animals commonly attack to convert fuel into flesh, for example. Human beings do attacks for different reasons. We've talked about ideology and what have you. But when technology affords you the ability to successfully cause tissue damage with no chance of getting injured, guess what you do? You cause tissue damage. Countries, you know, look what, look what the drone has meant to America in terms of, of what we do. And so the weaponized consumer drone is basically an intelligent bullet. And interestingly, I mean, in our study, you, you just, and you can find some things on YouTube you won't believe. You'll find a, a six-foot helicopter-style drone that uses a flying technology that is, uh, is stunning, the, the, the fastness with which it moves and the erratic nature of how it moves is literally indescribable. You'd have to see the video yourself to understand 
what it is when a drone is modified to be able to, it's called collective pitch for pilots in the audience. When a drone has collective pitch, you literally will, you'll think you're looking at a special effect. And so the drone itself, forget bombs, the drone itself is a weapon with carbon fiber rotors, for example. And the, and the, the, the next version is swarming drones. And, and we looked at a study, not a study, but a, an actual case study, it's happening, where 50 drones could be operated by one operator and avoid crashing into each other, but crash into what you told them to crash into. So the weaponized consumer drone we will all see, one has already landed on the roof of the uh, Japanese prime minister, one has already landed with radioactive material on it, one has already landed 14 inches from uh, the, the chancellor of West Germany. And, uh, and so we will see the weaponized consumer drone be an instrument of assassination, uh, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 when you look at it in historical context, every weapon that's ever been built has been used, and every weapon that's offered you distance has been used more. And, and this is one of those. So that's that's a thing for public appearances. Will they be used to drop powder at football games to scare people, and people will be injured because of that? Yes, all, all these things are coming. And you said a moment ago, you know that uh, ISIS in its death throes. I don't agree with you on that because it doesn't matter whether it's ISIS. ISIS is just a brand. That's that's you know that's today's episode. It may not matter. It's just that we know that there have been recent reports of them using them against Iraqi troops. I indeed, I understand. Gavin, I, I am painfully aware of how generous you've been with your time. And if we can steal 10 more minutes, I feel remiss in not talking to you about assassination and the obsession with celebrities and stalking and fame and just what media has done to this, the very nature of becoming a public figure. Can I get the brief download from you on this? Because on your account, all of this started more or less with Frank Sinatra in 1942, and it just changed the nature of celebrity. But mo most of us are living in a world where it is a commonplace that a public figure is someone who people can get obsessed about, and he or she therefore inherits this new burden of having to worry about stalkers and the prospect of being assassinated. Well, indeed, I'm glad to talk about it. And I think in one sense, it doesn't affect most audience members because most audience members aren't public figures. However, assassination itself, when successful, deeply affects uh, cultures and has throughout history. In fact, you know, there are, uh, if you think of Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and on and on and on, and you think of every assassination that, that you can remember reading about in history, all of them combined took less than 30 minutes of human history, meaning they are very fast actions. And, and accordingly, the technologies for preventing them are, are very complicated, but there is a tragic symbiotic relationship between assassins and other terrorists and television news that has led to a glorification. And, you know, assassins give great video, always visual, always dramatic. You can always get there in time, meaning that the minicam crew can always get there in time to get something of interesting. And, and assassins will not sue you, no matter what you say about them, if you're a television news station. And they provide, and terrorists, provide the number one feature that news producers love which is extendability, meaning it's going to keep going. You know, there's now there's going to be the pictures from the high school yearbook and there's going to be the trial and there's going to be the drama of waiting for the verdict. And then there's going to be that video of the attack again and again and again. And the problem is that that video of the attack is a commercial for some people. It's an advertisement as surely as Procter & Gamble ever pushed toothpaste. That approach to television uh, that's used by news pushes public figure attack. And I, I found this guy in, in researching for one of my books named a, a criminologist named Arthur McDonald. And he wrote that the most dangerous criminals are the assassins of rulers. And the reason is of the impact it had on the rest of society, like you think of the impact it had when John Lennon was killed, for example. But he suggested that newspapers and magazines, I'm quoting him now, and authors of books cease to publish the names of criminals. And if this isn't done voluntarily, let it be made a misdemeanor to do so, because this will lessen the hope for glory and renown and notoriety, which is the great incentive for such crimes. What's interesting about Arthur McDonald's quote is that it's from 1911. So he would be disappointed to see where it's actually gone in the media age that assassins end up with virtual you know, network reality shows. 
uh, I don't think he'd be surprised. But the way we have glorified violence in that regard, and of course in movies as well, is part of this problem. And for public figures, every public figure, and you know, uh, you know a lot, I know a lot of people who are public figures for one reason or another, and every one of them will have the experience of somebody trying to have a relationship with them as friend or enemy that they don't want. Everybody will have unwanted pursuit. And the belief from television is that I know Dave Letterman. I know him well from television. And so he's just a familiar guy to me. And I can be angry at him or I can fall in love with him just like anybody else in my life because it's all so familiar to me. Television basically uh, foments the, the myth and the belief that it's a real relationship when it isn't a real relationship. Gavin, we'll have to leave it there. It seems like the conversation could continue for yet another hour, but you've been precisely the wealth of information I knew you would be. So thank you for being so generous with your time. Uh, Sam, you're welcome. And thank you for being the wealth of information that you are for me. Every podcast, I listen to them all. Thankfully, I won't have to mm -hmm. listen to this one because I've heard it already. Uh, but thank you too. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and vote on the questions of others. And please know that your support is greatly appreciated. It's listeners like you that make this show possible.